G'day audio files, it's Dwayne here for the Sirens of Audio, just to introduce this bonus episode. Now we're going to be taking a couple of weeks off, Philip and I, that never happens does it? But yes, we are going to be taking a couple of weeks off to enjoy the live events that we're producing over the next few weeks and indeed next month, we've got Janet Fielding this month and Sophie Aldred next month here in Australia, so we thought we'd give ourselves a bit of a rest on the podcast side of things for at least one, maybe two weeks. But we do want to continue to release content of some description at our normal time slot. So never fear, we will be back with full episodes very soon. Oh, and keep in mind that our next episode is episode 150. And I know Philip does like to do something special for these big number podcasts. So we'll see what we can do for you for episode 150. Keep your eye on the podcast feed and the YouTube channel to see when that one drops. But in the meantime, we hope you enjoy this bonus episode and any other bonus ones that we deliver for you over the next week or two. And uh, we look forward to being back with you for that big one, that big episode 150. So today we're presenting to you the special feature that we were asked to do for the Big Finish podcast, the behind the scenes feature for the Six Doctor and Evelyn story, Blood Tide. We hope you enjoy it. Doctor Who, Blood Tide. There's something in here. Some sort of lizard, I think. Please, I saw them. The Bible tells us that this world of ours is a mere 6,000 years old. By the lake, El Hongo. That the Lord created in six days. That there was but one flood. Devils! With three eyes I saw them! It's about the size and proportions of a man. Two arms, two legs. They are here! So to my mind, these fossils should not exist. And now they have come back? Yes. Yes, they have come back. Director Gary Russell. Blood Toad came about because I wanted to do a Silurian story. I mean, (laughs) like, why did you do Red Dawn? I wanted Ice Warriors. Why did you do Blood Toad? I wanted Silurians. I mean, that's the the primary reason for anything with me with Silurians or Ice Warriors is the more I can have them, the better. Um, So I wanted a Silurian story. I wanted something that was different from other Silurian stories. So I wanted it to be historical. And I'd always been intrigued by Malcolm Hulk's introduction to the novelization of Cave Monsters, where he, or well, not, not the introduction, but all the way through, he implies this stuff about how they kept ape creatures as pets. You know, the early apes were their pets and they, they, they did things to them. And I think that's all I said to Johnny was, I wanted to be something about the Silurians and their opinion of humans because of that I want to know what they did to them in their sort of little concentration camps, if you like, where they kept them as pets and experimented on them. And the story came together very, very easily because Johnny is brilliant at just going, here's the story and suddenly you've got an entire story that's developed with characters and it all goes boom, boom, boom. And we talked a lot about the Silurian involvement in it and, and the you know, the usual thing with Silurians, you've got good Silurians and bad Silurians. But he came up with this idea that genetically mankind was actually created by silurians they were effectively god and i loved that idea i thought that was absolutely brilliant what we hadn't foreseen was the death threats that the two of us were then going to get from americans didn't get any death threats from anyone in britain got a lot of death threats and a lot of complaints from americans because we dared suggest that silurians were god rather than god was god Writer Jonathan Morris. With audio, there was lots of things to learn. And I was very lucky that Gary Russell sort of was acting as a sort of, you know, a teacher during the first process of um, how to establish a setting without having people saying where they are, how to get in and out of scenes, the sort of the grammar of if some if a character's in a scene, you need to have them talk in the first page of that scene to establish that they're there and all that, all that sort of stuff, which, um, I mean, I, I, in the end, I ended up writing a sort of a 
a how to write a Big Finish audio guide for Big Finish because I'd done so many. I got the hang of it fairly quickly, I think. I mean, the only thing that ever annoys me with Bloodside, really, is that it's too long. And it's too long because I thought when I was writing it that I'd write half an hour episodes, you know, about um, 5,500 words or 6,000 words. And then it would be edited down. I thought it would be edited down to 25 minutes. That's how it's always done on television and stuff. But what was released wasn't really edited down. I mean, Astolog did edit it down a tiny bit, but I would have gone through it all and got it down to 25 minute episodes. Just cutting out stuff which um, slows it down, really. Just so that the good bits are closer together, so you don't have to wait so long for the next good bit. But that's, apart from that, I think it turned out really, really well. Was that Johnny's first? I suppose it was, wasn't it? He had certainly submitted Anarachophobia to BBC Books, because I remember reading in Steve Cole's office the synopsis, and I think I so liked the synopsis of that, that before Steve had had the chance that he'd commissioned it and Johnny was writing it, but, <laughs> but before it actually came out, I'd already gone to Johnny and gone, right, I gather you're doing, I've seen you're doing this fantastic book for BBC Books, come and write an audio for me, because I could just see what a good writer he was. May I inquire as to the whereabouts of the rest of your party? It does seem strange to find you and your companion traversing the island alone. Ah, our boat is anchored on the far side of the island. We've walked for much of the day and fear we may not be able to return there before nightfall. Well, you must join me this evening. Oh. The, the governor of these islands is holding a dinner in honour of the crew of the Beagle. Is he? Well, we would be absolutely delighted to attend, wouldn't we, Evelyn? Delighted. Doctor... If Holmes. you will excuse me for a moment while I go and collect my specimens. Doctor, the Beagle, he's Charles Darwin. Oh, you guessed, have you? I knew Miles because he'd been around for years because he'd done downtime and he'd done the draconian things for Keith. And he was incredibly good friends with Lisa Bauman. And it was actually Lisa that introduced me. It was at Lisa's 40th, I think. Yes, it would have been her 40th. Uh, she introduced me to Miles. So I just liked him. I just thought he was a good bloke and he'd got a great voice. And I just thought, yeah, you know, you're Charles Darwin, without a doubt. And he relished it. He, he jumped at the chance to do that. Miles Richardson. It all stems from working for Real Time Pictures, um, Keith Barnfather, who you might have come across his work. He does Doctor Who spin offs in, in uh, video dramas. During that kind of fallow period when Doctor Who was off the air, it was people like Keith and Big Finish who were keeping the interest up. And I think it was because I'd done a piece for him that my name was sort of out there in the kind of Doctor Who firmament. I think it was because of that that. They got me in to do, first of all, I, I was in a, a, a Doctor Who one, playing, of all things, Charles Darwin. And they liked what I did. And I liked doing it because the great advantage of doing audio drama is you don't have to learn the lines. <laughs> you don't have to put on any makeup. You don't have to put any costume on. You can arrive in your civvies, you can get in the booth, you can read the bar, and you can go home. And you get a lovely, lovely, lovely lunch cooked by Toby, the sound technician. I'm sure you've all heard about the lovely lunches. And then, of course, they cast me as Irving. And what was interesting is because I knew nothing about this other world of Doctor Who. I must confess, I'm not really a huge science fiction fan. I, I, I know I'm a, I'm a big fan of drama, but I'm not necessarily a, a sci-fi fan. But what I, I discovered quite early on is that with science fiction, everything's possible. Absolutely everything is possible. I always work standing up because you can, I think you can hear when people are sitting down. Even when I'm supposed to be sitting down, <laughs> I'm standing up because you just have to free up, you know, your, your energy. I mean, I remember going, to, this is really weird, I'm a bit of a tangent, but I went to see an opera, Don Giovanni, uh, before it all, everything shut down. And there was one point when the actor the, the, sorry, I should say, the singer playing Don Giovanni was rolling around on the floor, but singing at the same time and I thought my god that is so extraordinary that he can actually roll around on the floor and still produce this extraordinary sound and of course I just suddenly thought well yeah that's the power of your diaphragm and your and, and your, your rib control and I figured you know that's that's exactly sort of what I do that when I'm in the booth I am giving it the power and energy that that voice needs at, if they, in that situation if you, you can't do that sitting down it can be very exhausting even though you're standing up in a booth, you're not even running around or... But, you know, it, it requires that level of effort. Otherwise, again, you're not, you're not um, portraying the, the drama of the situation. 
From the archives, Maggie Stables. Oh, I think it works wonderfully. Yeah, I love working with Colin and uh, love his sense of humour and professionalism. And I, I, I think that the sort of rapport comes through on the recordings. Well, I hope it does anyway. Yes, she does understand what he's talking about. That's uh, that's yes. that's her strength, yes. isn't it? Yeah. And she picks up any any references he makes because I mean, she's not only a historian; she's a very well-educated woman all round. I think. But I think she's she's not too um, frightened of him. I mean, she's impressed by him, obviously, but she's not. She doesn't feel too overshadowed. Just a little overshadowed. Colin Baker. Maggie Stables, I absolutely adored. She was a wonderful woman. She had any number of previous careers. Uh, I might be wrong, I think working in a bank was one, being a teacher was another. Um, and then she decided, it, uh, perhaps almost my age now, that she'd like to have a go at being an actor and did so with great distinction. And I, I think Nick Briggs had worked with her in something else, I think on stage. And he uh, had this idea for the Evelyn Smythe character. And the first story we did was the one about Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth, the Marian conspiracy. And I thought, ah, yes, we've got someone who and A, knows what they're doing and has a brain in her. Um, she was a very, very bright, clever, funny, kind person. And I greatly enjoyed that. And my doctor enjoyed having the challenge of Evelyn, who was as bright as a button, very learned and and didn't tolerate any of the doctor's airy persiflage when he was banging on about something ridiculous. And she, she wiped the floor with him. And I liked that too. So it was a great character. And I do miss her, I miss her still. I'd love to have uh, taken that journey a little further. Who else is in it? Dan Hogarth's in it playing the leader of the Silurians. Josie's in it doing his Spanish accent. And is it Helen Goldwyn doing a Spanish accent as well? Yes, that's right, yes. <laughs> you see, that, that's a big difference from the way I, I, over time for me working. If a year after that, or maybe 18 months after that, if that had come up again, I would have cast Spanish actors. In those days, I didn't have enough actors and I didn't have enough agents and I didn't have enough experience and, and knowledge of how to find people. I say 18 months on, if we'd done a story with Spanish people in it, I would have been casting Spanish actors because I think that's important. And that's not to take anything away from what Jez and Helen did because they sound Spanish. But my gut instinct is there are Spanish actors out there and we should be giving them work rather than giving English people work. Jez Fielder. So this was over 20 years ago, but I do remember the story and the recording. It was the second time I'd worked with Colin after we'd done the Marion Conspiracy the year before. I love working with Colin because he's naughty. <laughs> Aside from being a font of knowledge, he's also very funny and um, and he'd muck about. And I love people who muck about. And I think Gary Russell, who I think directed pretty much everything I did in my first few years at Big Finish, probably got weary from you know rolling his eyes all the time. but. You know, Colin was never irritating to the director or producer because he was so good at audio drama, so engaged with the with the format, I suppose. And his, his exposition was brilliant. Well, <laughs> one thing you could try try to do with Colin if you were in a in a scene with him is to attempt to make the last sound before the sound engineers stop rolling. <laughs> Forget it. Uh, you couldn't. It was impossible. Colin would find a way to, to trump you, whatever, whatever you did. There would sometimes even be um, a gap of... I'm just laughing because I'm remembering I'm remembering how it was. There'd be like a gap of, I don't know, just a small gap of maybe, maybe even a couple of seconds. Um, and almost like he knew the mind of the control room when he was about to, you know, when the sound is and he was about to press stop, he'd whack in a... Mm. And... <laughs> <laughs> just right at the very last minute. I mean, I'm sure not all of these were kept, but um, you know, he'd he'd kind of do it without fail. And I guess the other reason blood tide sticks in my mind is a sort of silly one. Uh, it's because it featured a creature that sounded like uh, a pubic wig. There was a species called the murka, <laughs> and, and if you look it up, uh, as I have, it resembles the Cookie Monster from the Muppets, but sort of soaked in petrol. 
Um, <laughs> I had to be a Silurian, two, two Silurians in fact. Um, the production team brought in a recording. So we're all in the moat and they, they brought in this, I don't know whether it was a VHS at the time or a DVD, but they, they wheeled out a television with probably a VHS player attached to it and played um, a scene from Doctor Who and the Silurians, I think it was, with John Pertwee. And there was a there was a good good scene where there was quite a lot of Silurian chat. So they played that a few times, and those of us that were going to play Silurians kind of you know sat and listened, and then we had time. Then we, they gave us a few minutes to kind of go off and you know try it out um, privately, <laughs> um, and you know try and get the voice right. Because I think there's a temptation if you've never done an alien voice before to assume that you know it, it's all going to be done in post production with with voice effects but it's not true at all you, you have to give a you have to give a good impersonation of the final final voice when you perform it you know otherwise it just doesn't it just doesn't it just doesn't work post production will enhance what you've done but there's no just you know reading the lines in a in a human way silurians were quite low and um sort of gruff the hibernation mechanism was faulty. So, so it's like, um, it's like Brian Blessed has been slowed down and deepened. <laughs> but the, the story was brilliant. The whole cast liked it. We talked about it a lot. It was, you know, um, displacing the Doctor and his companion to, to um, you know, a, a historically recognisable place. It was quite touching to see Evelyn's sort of enthusiastic historian come across a young Charles Darwin. I mean, how. How extraordinary with that. Um, Miles Richardson was very good and hilarious between takes. I remember lots of knob gags. <laughs> the Merka is moving away from the ape creature's vessel. I hope it enjoyed its meal. You were using a sonic implant. Their use in Merka hunts is forbidden. It is excessively cruel. Shibak, the numbers of these ape creatures must be contained by any means necessary. You have prepared the bacterial culture? Yes. It is carried by an airborne microorganism. Unchecked, it will swiftly lead to a pandemic amongst the ape creatures. The plague will wipe out all but the newborn. And it kills quickly. Death is inevitable in a matter of minutes. Excellent. Leader, the two ape creatures have been captured and placed in the enclosure. Good. We shall test the bacteria at once. The sound design is, is obviously, when you're doing an audio production, Sound design is pretty much your most important thing. You, 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 basically three very important things. You have a script that works for audio. You have a bunch of talented actors that can do audio, and then you have sound designers and musicians who make the whole thing come together and look brilliant at the end of the day. And I was very lucky in that I had a bunch of very very good sound designers. I, I you know, we had Harvey at the beginning. And to be honest, without Harvey. Big Finish would probably never really got off the ground. He 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 worked very very hard and did us an awful lot of favours. Um, but Harvey lived about two hours out of London, and after a couple of years, he was just like, I can't keep coming up to London and doing these recordings. And so we brought Alistair in to do the in studio recording, um, and Harvey was still doing a lot of the post. And then Alistair started doing post and music, particularly on Nick's stuff that Nick didn't want to do himself. I mean, Nick usually did his own sound design, but if he didn't, he, he, Alistair was always his first choice. So I had Alistair, I had Nick, and I had Harvey all knowing what they were doing. When we did Gallifrey, I brought Davey Darlington into it, and then we had ERS turned up. And that was the point where suddenly I realized, oh, I've just got this brilliant uh, menagerie, if you like, of superb musicians and sound designers. And I was able to completely relax and start allocating to because in the early days, it was all Harvey and a bit of Alistair and a little bit of Nick. And that was getting a bit panicky. So by the time we came to do the McGann's, we got ERS involved. And then I say Davy came in when we were doing Gallifrey and suddenly it, it, my life was a lot easier. And every single one of these uh, sound designers has a slightly different approach to the whole thing. And that was always interesting. And as much as writers and actors are very different creatures, so are sound designers and, and what they do and their general approach to things is very, very different. And it's quite fun. And I can sometimes sit down and listen to one of these and go, 
oh, I know whose sound design that was. Just because of the effects that he used or the way things are used or the way the stereo soundscape is used, Davey was very, very good at moving things around in stereo and so were ERS, very, very good at that. And then you've got the musicians. So, you know, Nick always did his own music. Uh, ERS came on board with Russell and he did his music. Davey did some music. Harvey always did music. And then we started having, we brought in extra musicians because I was going to the, the sound design team. I know you love doing the music as well. So I think really all of them want to do music before they want to do sound design. I said, but I need you to do sound design. And we've got a lot of productions. So you're going to have to keep doing sound design and I'm going to bring in some extra musicians. And that's how Jim Mortimer came in and did some music. Uh, Justin Rich's brother and his girlfriend, Emily, came in and did some stuff on the Bennies. And so more and more people started, I started bringing people in and Nick would, whereas I was always on the lookout, I was, you know, obsessed with obviously the writers and that was my job was to, to worry about the creative side of everything. But I asked Nick as a sort of sideline if he would audition, if you like, new sound teams and new musicians. And so he always had that as a sort of little thing ticking on the background. And once in a blue moon, he'd turn around and say, Come, I think we should give this guy a go. I've sent him a few test things and he's really done this. And so we'd bring in a couple of new musicians or a couple of new sound designers to see how they'd work. But they're the backbone of it. You know, that without them, you don't have an audio production because no matter how good a script and the actors are, at the end of the day, the people that actually make it a listen, enjoyable listening experience are the sound designers and the musicians. 